Hello students, you're welcome to the Rock Tutors Learning Made Easy. My name is Cheson. Today we are going to be looking at some questions in chemistry. Let's get started. The very first question. The byproduct of fermentation of sugar is, is obviously option A, carbon four oxide. We know that during fermentation of sugar, two major products are obtained. When sugar undergoes fermentation, the major product is ethanol, C2H5OH, while the byproduct is carbon four oxide. So the correct answer is option A. Let's take a look at the second one. Number two. Which of the following sugars is a product of the condensation of monosaccharides? Now, we know that sugars are categorized into monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. Now, monosaccharides, most of the time, are also called reducing sugars. And disaccharides, as the name suggests, is made up of two monosaccharides. Why polysaccharides? Even the word poly means many, made up of several monosaccharides. So, which of the following sugars is a product of the condensation of monosaccharide? Put in another way, the question is asking us which of these sugars is a disaccharide or a polysaccharide? Galactose is a monosaccharide. Glucose is a monosaccharide. Fructose is also a monosaccharide. The correct answer here is maltose. Maltose is a disaccharide that is formed due to condensation of two molecules of glucose. So maltose is made up of two molecules of glucose. So the correct answer is maltose. Don't forget that apart from maltose, you also have sucrose. Sucrose is formed by condensation of glucose and fructose. Not only that, lactose is formed by the condensation of one mole of glucose and one mole of galactose. The correct option is B. Number three, the cleaning effect of soap is low in acidic water because of, we know that soap cleanses materials, soap cleanses materials, cloth during cleaning. But this cleaning effect is very low in acidic water. The question is why? Because of option A, whenever soap is used with or used in acidic water, there is a formation of a long unionized fatty acid. So the cleaning effect of soap is low in acidic water because of the formation of long chain of unionized fatty acid. Option A is the correct answer here. Let's go to number four. The following compounds are condensation polymers except lylon is the condensation polymer, protein, is a condensation polymer. Protein is caused by condensation of several amino acids. Starch is a condensation polymer formed by condensation of several moles of glucose. The correct answer is D. Polyethylene or polyethylene is an addition polymer. So, lylon, protein, and starch, they are all examples of condensation polymer. Whereas polyethylene, polystyrene, Aspects and the like, they are all examples of addition polymer. So the correct answer here is D, polyethylene is an addition polymer, not a condensation polymer. Let's go to number five. What amount of electricity is required to deposit one mole of aluminium from a solution of aluminium chloride? Let's take a look at the board and see how we can get the question. Aluminium chloride is AlCl3. When this is broken down, it's going to produce Al3 plus aluminum ion and then 3Cl minus. Now, we are focusing our attention on this. So we want to find out how many Faradays of electricity we deposit or we discharge one mole of aluminium, Al3 plus. How many electrons will this gain since you have plus three here? There will be three electrons here to form one mole of aluminium in solid form. So we can see there is three electrons here. Don't forget that three electrons 
is equal to 3 Faraday because one electron is equal to one Faraday. So three electron is equal to three Faraday. So one mole of aluminium requires three F. That's three Faradays of electricity. Three Faradays. So and if you look at the options, that is option C. So the correct answer is option C. Let's look at number six. Which of the following compounds will react rapidly with bromine? We know that bromine especially bromine water is used for testing for unsaturation in organic compounds so benzene and exene both benzene and, be and exene will react with bromine water but the question specifically asks us which of them will react rapidly emphasis on rapidly with bromine benzene will react with bromine all right but the reaction is not rapid the reaction only takes place in the presence of catalyst. The correct answer here is option C. Exene will act rapidly with bromine. As a matter of fact, if exene is dropped, dropwise into bromine, almost instantly as exene gets in contact with bromine water, the bromine water is decolorized almost instantaneously. So the correct answer is C. Exene reacts rapidly with bromine water. Don't forget, benzene also reacts with bromine water, but not rapidly. That's what makes C to be the correct answer. Number seven. Alkanos can be manufactured from alkanes by the initial reaction of alkanes with the correct answer here is B, concentrated tetraosulfate six acid. Let's take a look at the board and see. How? If you want to produce alkanols, we can do that by adding concentrated H2SO4 as follows. So, let's say we want to produce ethanol. We can produce ethanol by adding concentrated H2SO4 to ethane. This is ethane. If you add concentrated H2SO4, that's H2SO4. And that will give us C2, H5, H, S, O4. This is the addition compound. Then after that, we now hydrolyze this. Hydrolyze means that we had water to it. So we now have C2, H5, H, S, O4. Plus H2O. That's the hydrolyzing aspect. And then the product now will now be C2H5OH plus H2SO4. So we can see this is our ethanol that we want to produce. So the correct answer here is option B. So when we want to produce alkanol, we can do that by the initial reaction of alkane. An example of an alkane is ethane with concentrated H2SO4. Correct answer is option B. Let's look at number 8. Which of the following statements about the standard hydrogen electrode is not correct? Which of the following statements about the standard hydrogen electrode or the standard hydrogen electrode potential is not correct? If you look at the options, the correct answer is D. The temperature is kept at 20 degrees Celsius. We know that when we, are when we are measuring the standard electrode potential, we use the standard, the standard hydrogen electrode as the reference point. And it is taken, the standard hydrogen electrode is taken as zero volt. But there should be some conditions. Number one, the concentration has to be one mole per dm cube. Not only that, the temperature has to be 298 Kelvin. Now, 298 Kelvin translates in degrees Celsius to 25 degrees Celsius, not 20 degrees Celsius. So, that makes option D the correct answer. Option A is correct, is true. Remember, the question says not correct. So, option, the statement A is correct. The hydrogen gas is at a pressure of one atmosphere. That's one of the conditions. Solution containing one more per day could have said that. A while ago, a platinum electrode is used. Usually, you make this a platinum or an art electrode, but the temperature has to be kept at 298 Kelvin or 25 degrees Celsius, not 
20 degrees Celsius. That makes this statement D not to be correct. And that makes it our own correct answer here. Number nine. If 60 gram of M combines with 24 gram of oxygen, what would the empirical formula of the oxide be? Let's take a look at how to solve this. The mass of M is 60 gram. Let's put it here, 60 gram. While the mass of oxygen is 24 gram. Let's put it here. And we know that the atomic mass of M, according to the question, is 120. So we divide this one by 120. And the atomic mass of oxygen is 16. So we divide this by 16. So if you divide 60 by 120, we are going to get 0 0.5. And if you divide 24 by 16, 24 divided by 16, we give us 1.5. What do we do next? We are going to divide both of them by the smaller of the two. 0 0.5 is obviously smaller than 1.5. So we divide both of them by 0 0.5. So this divided by 0 0.5. This divided by 0 0.5. Divided by 0 0.5. This goes in there. That's 1. And 1.5 divided by 0 0.5 will give us 3. So if you write this one, so which means that M has one mole. And oxygen here, that's 3. So the empirical formula will now give us MO3. And if you take a look at the options, that is option C. So option C is the correct answer. Let's go to number 10. The products of the electrolysis of dilute sodium chloride using carbon electrodes are... The question is asking us... If we electrolyze dilute NaCl using an inert electrode because carbon and platinum electrodes are called inert electrodes. Don't forget, inert electrodes are those electrodes that do not take part, do not actively take part during electrolysis. So let's look at the board and see how we are going to get our answer here. Sodium chloride, we know sodium chloride is going to break down to produce... Na plus and Cl minus. And since sodium chloride will be dissolved in water, when water ionizes, water undergoes partial ionization to produce hydrogen ion and hydroxide ion. Now we have two cations and we have two anions. So at the cathode, at cathode, maybe let's start with anode. At the anode, the anions, Cl minus, that's chloride ion and hydroxide ion, both of them will migrate to the anode. But only one of them will be preferentially discharged. And how do we know which one will be preferentially discharged? We well, remember that there are three factors that affect preferential discharge of ions during electrolysis. One of the factors is the position of the ions in the electrochemical series. And the Rule tells us that ions that are lower in the electrochemical series will be discharged in preference to ions that are higher in the electrochemical series. And if you take a look at the electrochemical series, we are going to have something like F minus, SO4, 2 minus, NO3 minus, then we are going to have Cl minus, Br minus. I minus and then OH minus. So this summarizes the electrochemical series for the anion. So we can see that the hydroxide ion is lower than the chloride ion. Now that we know this, and we know that it is an ion that is lower, that will be discharged in preference to ion that is higher. So hydroxide, hydroxide ion will be discharged at the anode here. So which means if we write this so we now have oh minus remember what kind of what kind of reaction occurs at the anode that's oxidation oxidation means loss of electron so this gives us h2o gives us oxygen and then electron to balance the equation for air two air and four air now let's take a little take a look at this oxygen 
is liberated at the anode. Now, understand, we know what is liberated at the anode. The next thing is to find what will happen at the cathode. Let's take a look at what occurs at the cathode. So at the cathode, both sodium ion and hydrogen ion, both sodium and hydrogen ion, we both migrate to the cathode. But only one of them will end up being, being discharged. How do we know which one will be discharged? The same thing, the same knowledge that we applied here. This time around, we have to know the relative position of sodium ion and hydrogen ion in the electrochemical series. We know that the ion that is lower will be discharged in preference to ion that is higher. And we know from our electrochemical series, potassium ion is high. After that, sodium ion, we have calcium ion, we have magnesium ion, we have aluminium ion, we have zinc, we have iron, then we have tin, then we have lead, we have hydrogen, we have copper, we have mercury, we have silver, and then we have gold. So if you take a look at this, let's look at the position of sodium here and the position of hydrogen here. And we know that the ion that is lower will be discharged in preference of ion that is higher. So looking at the two of them, we know that hydrogen will be discharged. And we know what kind of reaction occurs at the cathode, that is reduction. What is reduction? Reduction can be defined among other definitions as gain of electron. So what happens? Hydrogen ion will gain electron to become discharged as hydrogen molecule. To balance this, we put two air and then we put two air. So we can see that hydrogen gas is produced at the cathode and oxygen gas is produced at the anode. Let's take a look at the options now. So option A to see which one will be the correct answer here. We know that oxygen is produced at the anode. So anode, oxygen is produced at the anode. And at the cathode, we know that hydrogen is produced. Hydrogen is produced at the cathode. So our correct option is option B. Let's go to number 11, please. Hello, students. I trust you are enjoying the class so far. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you'll be notified as soon as we have a new content. Don't also forget to like, to share, and to leave us a comment. Thank you very much. Okay, let's go to number 11. Determine the quantity of electricity used when a current of 0.2 amperes is passed through an electrolytic cell for 60 meanings. Let's take a look at the board and see how we can solve this. We'll be given the current to be 0 0.20 ampere and we are given the time taken to be 60 minutes. Don't forget, we have to convert this time to seconds. So this becomes 60 times 60 Second, so that our time now is 6 and 60 seconds that gives us 3600 seconds. And we have to calculate the quantity of electricity that's talking about the charge. And we know that our Q that's going to of electricity is equal to current times the time in seconds. So, which means our current 0 0.2 times the time in seconds that's 3600. Don't forget the unit. Of quantity of electricity is coulombs that's c and if you multiply let's multiply and see 0 0.2 times 3600 that gives us 720 that's 720 coulomb that's the correct answer now if you take a look at the option that is option d let's go to the next question please okay number 12 Oxochlorate 1 acid is used as a bleaching agent because it is first things first. What is oxochlorate 1 acid? Oxochlorate 1 acid is also called hypochlorous acid. H-O-C-L or H-C-L-O. At times, it's also called chlorine water. 
So, osoclutone acid is used as a bleaching agent because it is, option C, an oxidizing agent. What makes osoclutone acid? What makes hypochlorous acid or what makes chlorine water? A very good bleaching agent is because of its oxidizing ability. Because osoclutone is an oxidizing agent, it is used as a bleaching agent agent so the correct answer is option c don't forget that chlorine and chlorine bleaches substances so also does sulfur for oxide but the difference between the two of them is chlorine bleaches by oxidation while sulfur for oxide so2 bleaches by reduction what does it mean when chlorine bleaches chlorine bleaches permanently the color cannot be regained again but when so2 bleaches it bleaches Temporarily, after some time, the bleached material can undergo oxidation and the color could be regained. That is why straw art turns yellow after some time because the bleaching action of sulfur oxide is reduced as a result of reduction. Don't forget that there is one similarity, one major similarity between the bleaching action of SO2 and that of chlorine. Both the bleaching action of chlorine and sulfur oxide requires that water be present. That is that. The correct answer, once again, is option C. Let's go to number 13. Number 13 now. The IUPAC name for this compound is to have a very good understanding of this. Let's take a look at the board and see how we can do this. That's C H T D. That will make it easier if you write it in this form. The CH, this one C H, and then CH3. This is the CH3 here. Then CACL, this C, one H, and then the CL, and then CH, C, that's H. And CH3, the CH3 under substituent is here. Then CH2, the CH2, one hydrogen here, one hydrogen here. And finally, CH3, C, one hydrogen, one hydrogen, one hydrogen, CH3. So let's take a look at it again. CH3, that's CH3, CH, that's CH, CH3, that's CH3. CH, that's CH, then CL, that's CL, CH, that's CH, CH3, that's CH3, CH2, that's CH2, CH3, CH3. Now, to know what the IUPAC name will be, we should remember the rules that guide nomenclature of organic compound. First things first, we have to focus our attention on these substituents here. The branched group here. Now, this is CHD, that's methyl. This is CL, that's chloro. This under CHD, that's methyl. Now, whenever we have more than one substituent, we have to take them alphabetically. We know that chloro C comes before M in methyl. And we have to count from the side closest to this chlorine. If we start counting from the side here, that will be one, two, three, four. That will be chloro. That's not, this side is not closest to this. But if we start from here, we are going to have one, two, three. So this side is closer to chlorine than this side. So we are supposed to start counting from this side. So this is the first carbon, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth. So this is going to be one, two, three. That will be three chloro. Then one, two. This one methyl group, that's two. Then one, two, three, four. This is another methyl group, that's four. Now, since we are having two methyl group, that's dimethyl. Dimethyl. Then the parent name, the parent chain now. That's one, two, three, four, five, six. That's exine, exine. So the correct name now is 3-chloro, 2,4-dimethyl, exine. Let's take a look at the option to see which option tallies with this. 
that is option D. 3 chloro 24 dimethyl hexane. The correct answer for number 13 is option D. Let's go to number 14. A colorless gas with pungent smell is evolved. Evolved means given off. When dilute hydrochloric acid is added to a sample of a salt, the gas evolved could turn. First things first, a colorless gas with a pungent smell. What comes to mind? If you say a colorless gas with a pungent smell, and not only that, we are told that the gas was evolved when dilute ACL hydrochloric acid is added to a sample of a salt. Now, one of the gases that is pungent in smell is hydrogen sulfide. As a matter of fact, if it's hydrogen sulfide, it has a distinctive smell like rotten egg smell. Another gas that is pungent in smell is sulfur 4 oxide gas. That's a pungent or choking smell. Now, we are told that the gas evolved could turn between hydrogen sulfide and SO2, acidified potassium dichromate solution, colorless. Acidified KMNO4 solution colorless, iron nitrate solution green, and lead nitrate paper black. Now, if the gas is hydrogen sulfide, it will have been specified that a colorless gas with a pungent smell like rotten egg smell. So, the most likely gas. The most likely gas they are talking about here, when they say colorless gas with a pungent smell that is evolved when dilute hydrochloric acid is added to a sample of salt, is SO2. How do we know when hydrogen chloride gas, when hydrochloric acid rather dilute ACL is added to sodium triosulfate 4 that's Na2SO3, SO2 gas is given off, and we know that SO2 gas is a reducing agent and SO2 will turn acidified potassium permanganate solution colorless. So the correct answer for this is number 14. Don't forget that SO2, even though SO2 will, will change the color of acidified K2CRO2O7, it will change it from orange to green, not colorless. So that's why the correct answer is B. SO2, which is the most likely colorless gas being referred to air, will turn acidified KMNO4 solution to brown, that is from purple, which is the original color, to colorless. That is the correct answer, option B. Okay, number 15. If 5.0 gram of mambo reacts with 25 cm cube of hydrochloric acid, which are the following combinations as the fastest reaction rate? Option A, Mabushi. As a matter of fact, when we look at this, we know they can't produce the highest rate of reaction. Why? Because men, when they are in ships, that's in lump form, they have low, surf they have low surface area. So our emphasis, at least our gaze, should be on the powdered marble because when a lump form, when something in lump form has been reduced to powdery form, we have essentially increased the surface area. And we know that the higher the surface area, the higher or the faster the rate of a chemical reaction. So the correct answer here is going to be option C, powdered marble and 2.5 mole per dn cube. Why is it? Because powdered marble has a large larger surface area, not only that, 2.5 mole per dm cube, the concentration of, two point of this particular ACL in option C is 2.5 mole per dm cube, which is higher than 2.0 here because we know that the higher the concentration, the faster the rate of a chemical reaction, except of course for zero other reaction, whose rate of reaction is independent, that is, does not depend on the concentration. The correct answer is option C because in powdered form, Option C has a large surface area and the larger the surface area, the faster the rate of the chemical reaction. Not only that, the concentration is higher than what obtains in option B and we know the higher the concentration, the faster the rate of the chemical reaction except for a zero order reaction. The option, the correct option here is option C, number 16. Increasing the temperature generally, A, 
decreases the solubility of a solid in a liquid but increases the solubility of a gas in a liquid basically the question is asking us the effect of temperature on the solubility of both solid and liquid and we know that generally when we increase the temperature the solubility of solid in the liquid increases whereas the reverse is the case for gases when there is an increase in temperature the solubility of gases decrease so the correct answer should be when the temperature increases the solubility of solid in liquid increases why the solubility of gases in liquid decreases let's see which option agrees with that assertion increase in temperature generally increase the solubility increases the solubility of a solid in a liquid but decreases the solubility of a gas in a liquid that's the correct answer the correct answer here is b whenever the temperature increases the solubility of a solid in a liquid also increases but the solubility of a gas in a liquid decreases as the temperature increases the correct answer is option b let's go to number 17. a white precipitate was formed when barium chloride was added to an aqueous solution of a salt the precipitate dissolved in dilute acl with rapid effervescence salt x is likely to contain the correct answer here is definitely option b that is sulfite ion or sulfate for ion that is actually one of the tests how to test for sulfide or triosyl sulfate for ion when we add barium chloride barium chloride solution to a particular or no salt and a white precipitate was observed and then we had dilute acid either dilute acl if you hadn't dilute acl it means you are going to make use of barium chloride but at times you can make use of barium nitrate that's b a n o 3 2 that's barium triosyl nitrate 5 if you make use of barium triosyl nitrate 5 a white precipitate will also be formed but on addition of dilute nitric acid that's hno3 an effervescence occurs and that gas that is given off during the effervescence will be sulfur 4 oxide gas so2 the correct answer for this is option b number 17 is option b let's go to number 18. before a reaction could take place there should be that before a reaction can take place the bond in the reactant must be broken so that new bonds could be formed in the product so the correct answer here is option c before a reaction could take place there should be breakage of bonds of reactants so option c is the correct answer number 19 we have to consider this equation calcium oxide or quicklime reacting with silicon four oxide to produce calcium triosyl silicate and then we are asked that silicon four oxide is acting as dash the correct answer is going to be an acidic oxide silicon four oxide is an acidic oxide as you can see calcium oxide is a base is a basic oxide and acidic ox the silicon four oxide is acting as an acidic oxide by reacting with this base to form a silicate salt which is CaSiO3 so the correct answer is option C the silicon four oxide is acting as an acidic oxide let's go to number 20 which of the following acids will form normal salt only now there are a lot of acid that can form both normal salt and acidic salt but the question is specifically asking us which of the following acids will form only normal salt normal salt are only formed by monobasic acid that is acid whose basicity is one and if you look at tetra phosphate 5 acid the basicity here is three if you look at triosonitrate 5 acid, which is the correct answer, the basicity is 1. If you look at option C, tetraosophosphate 5 acid, the basicity is also. The two of them are the same. So the basicity is 3, and then triososulfate 4 acid, the basicity is 3. So the correct answer here is 
B. Triosyl nitrate. The basis for triosyl sulfate for acid is 2. So the correct answer here is B. Triosyl nitrate 5 acid. HNO3 and HCl. Both of them are monobasic and both of them all only form normal salt. They can form acidic salt. Tetrasulfasis acid H2SO4 can form both normal salt and acidic salt. Just like phosphoric acid H3PO4 can form both normal salt and acidic salt. But acid that are monobasic like HNO3, transonitrophic acid, and ACL, hydrochloric acid, can only form normal salt. The correct option is B, number 21. What is the partial pressure of oxygen at STP? In gaseous mixture containing 100 centimeter cube of oxygen and 900 centimeter cube of nitrogen gas. Let's take a look at the board and see how we can solve this. We want to find what the partial pressure of oxygen is at STP. First things first, at STP, at STP, the total pressure would be 1 atmospheres don't let us forget that one atmosphere now what is the volume of oxygen in this mixture the volume of oxygen volume of o2 is 100 centimeter cube while the volume of nitrogen gas n2 is 900 centimeter cube so the total volume the total volume will be the volume of oxygen plus the volume of nitrogen, which would be 100 centimeter cube plus 900 centimeter cube. That's 1,000 centimeter cube. So if you want to calculate the partial pressure of oxygen now, the partial pressure of oxygen will be the volume of oxygen all over the total volume of the gaseous mixture multiplied by the total pressure. So this will give us volume of oxygen is 100 all over the total volume of the gas of the gaseous mixture 1000 multiplied by the total pressure at STP. That's one atmosphere here, 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 here. 1 divided by 10, that's 0 0.1. 0 0.1 multiplied by 1 is still 0 0.1. So the partial pressure of oxygen is equal to 0 0.1 atmospheres. So that's the correct answer. Let's take a look at the option. That would be option B. So the correct option here is option B, 0 0.1 atmosphere. Let's go to number 22. Graphite is used as a dry lubricant due to the presence of layered structure. We know that graphite is an excellent dry lubricant because the layered structure can easily slide over each other so the correct answer is option d because of the layered structure don't forget that graphite is not even octahedral in structure it is hexagonal so the correct answer is d number 23 now which of the following gases is alkaline the correct answer is definitely c ammonia is the most popular alkaline gas if you look at option A, nitrogen 4 oxide is an acidic gas. It's, it's actually an example of a double or mixed acid and hydride. If it dissolves in water, it forms not one, but two acids. That's HNO2 and HNO3. Option B, that's CO2. Carbon 4 oxide is also an acidic oxide. If you look at option D, that's dinitrogen 1 oxide, also called laughing gas, is an example of a neutral oxide so the correct option like i've said is option c ammonia ammonia is an alkaline gas let's go to number 24 which of the following statements about an equilibrium system is correct option a is definitely the correct answer when a system is in equilibrium when a chemical system is in equilibrium the rate of the forward and backward reaction will be the same so the forward and backward reactions occur at the same rate not only that when the reaction is in equilibrium the gibbs free energy that's delta g will also be equal to a zero and don't forget students that before a chemical reaction especially chemical reaction that involves gases 
can attain equilibrium such a reaction must take place in what in an isolated or a closed system so the correct answer here is option a let's go to number 25 we have to consider this reversible reaction nitrogen plus three moles of hydrogen reversible sign to give us two moles of ammonia and we can see from the negative sign of the enthalpy change here is an exothermic reaction that is it is released to the environment increasing the temperature of the reaction would very easy immediately we saw this we knew that this reaction before the reaction is exothermic that is it is released to the environment and increasing the temperature we do what we shift the equilibrium to the left hand side that is to the product side so let's look at the option equilibrium shift the equilibrium to the right that's not that's not true we i just said that the equilibrium will be shifted to the left if the temperature is increased increase the yield of ammonia that's also incorrect because ammonia is on the right hand side and equilibrium will have shifted to the left hand side so it definitely won't increase the yield of ammonia option c decrease the amount of hydrogen hydrogen is on the left hand side and the equilibrium is shifted to the left hand side so that will increase not decrease so the correct option is d decrease the yield of ammonia obviously because the equilibrium is shifting to the left hand side so it will decrease it will reduce the amount of ammonia that is produced it will not favor the product which is ammonia it will favor the formation of the reactant which is on the left hand side so the correct option is d number 26 when air in a syringe is compressed such that there is no change in temperature that is temperature is kept con constant that is an example of an isothermal reaction or system d is it a air liquefies or b pressure increases or c intermolecular space increases or d the density decreases whenever we compress air what are we doing we are increasing when air is compressed when air is compressed it means that the volume actually decreases and don't forget according to Boyle's law when volume decreases what amount of prayer prayer increases because the relationship between the volume and prayer is inverse volume is always inversely proportional to the prayer and when we compress a syringe we are reducing the volume of air in the syringe and that will lead to a chorus that will lead to an increase in prayer so the correct answer here is option B. When air in the Senate is compressed, the prayer will, will increase. Why will it increase? Now, when air is compressed, the air, the air is now made to occupy a smaller volume compared to the volume they were occup I mean, they occupied before. And because the molecules are now confined into a smaller space, the molecules are going to be colliding more frequently with the walls of the container and the more frequently they collide with the wall of the container the higher the prayer the correct option once again is b number 27 which are the following statements about liquid is or are true Roman figure one liquid maintain their volume at constant temperature that's absolutely true liquid really changes their volume so liquid maintain their volume at constant temperature Robert figure two liquid have fixed shape we know that liquid do not have fixed shape they only take the shape of the container in which they are poured so statement two is wrong three liquid do not diffuse we know that liquid diffuse they move from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration so statement three is also incorrect statement four change in prayer affects volume of liquid we know that change in prayer only affects the volume of a gas not that of liquid so the co the only correct statement here is from figure one which is option a so the correct option is option a number 28 now a hydrogen chloride gas reacted with oxygen gas to yield water and chlorine gas the mole ratio of the hydrogen chloride gas to water is that let's take a look at the board let's write a balanced equation for this reaction and see what the correct answer will be a hydrogen chloride gas that's acl 
In gaseous form, that's the meaning of adenine chloride gas is different from hydrochloric acid, which would be in aqueous form. Reacted with oxygen gas, reacted with oxygen. Now, to produce, to yield water, that's water, in liquid form, and chlorine gas, that's Cl2, in gaseous form. All we need to do is balance this. If you want to balance this, we can put four air, Hydrogen is now 4. To balance hydrogen here, we put 2 here. Now, 2 oxygen now. So, that balances this. But remember, 4 also affects chlorine. So, chlorine is 4. So, we have to put 2 here. So, everything is balanced now. So, the mole ratio of hydrogen chloride. How many moles of hydrogen chloride do we have here? That's 4. Ratio to water. And how many moles of water do we have here? That's 2. Ratio 2. 2 goes here. 2. 2 goes here, 1. So the mole ratio is 2, ratio 1. And if you take a look at the option, that is option B. So option B is the correct answer. Number 29. Okay, number 29. What number of moles of oxygen will excite a prayer of 10 atmosphere at 320 Kelvin in, a, in an 8.2 dm cube cylinder? This is very simple. Let's take a look at the board and see how we can solve this. You see, remember the famous formula, PV is equal to NRT. We have P is the prayer, V is the volume, N is the number of moles, what we are expected to calculate here. R is the gas constant will be given, and then T is the temperature in Kelvin, which has been given. So what is our prayer? We'll be given the prayer to be 10 atmospheres, we be given the volume to be 8.2 dm cube, 8.2 dm cube. We we'll be given the gas constant to be 0 0.082. And we be given the absolute temperature to be 320 Kelvin. So here, if you copy it, PEV is equal to NRT. So if you divide both sides by RT, Divide both sides by ROT so that our N, our N now is equal to PV all over ROT. Our P is 10 times our V, that's volume, that's 8.2, divided by our gas constant R is 0 0.082 times the absolute temperature, TD20 Kelvin, TD20. So our N now is, if we, this multiplied by this will give us just 82, divided by this multiplied by this, let's see, 0 0.082 times 320, that gives us 26.24. And if you divide this, that will be 82, divided by 26.24, that will give us 3.125. So n is equal to 3.13. We can approximate this one to be 3. So that is the correct answer. And if you look at the option, that is option C. Number 30. If 50 centimeter cube of a saturated solution of potassium triosinate 5 at 40 degrees Celsius contain 5.05 gram of the salt, we are asked to calculate the solubility at the same 40 degree. Celsius and we'll be given the molar mass of KNO3 to be 101 gram per mole. So let's take a look at how to do this. Don't forget, we'll be given the volume, volume in centimeter cube in cm cube has been given to be 50. Not only that. Will be given the mass of the salt. The mass of the salt has been given to be 5.05 gram. And the molar mass of this particular salt is 101. That's gram per mole. So, what we need to calculate now is the solubility. And don't forget, there's a simple formula for calculating the solubility. And it goes like this we have the mass of the salt all over the molar mass of the salt is equal to the solubility times the volume in centimeter cube divided by 1000. 
That's all. All we need to do is just make our solubility here the subject of the formula. The mass of the salt has been given to be 5.05. That's 5.05 divided by the molar mass of the salt. That's 101. 101 is equal to the solubility. That's what we need. Represented by x times the volume. That's 50 cm cube already given divided by 1000. What do we do? We just cross multiply. So that here we now have x times 50. That's 50x, or we could do it like this. You can divide this by this, so that this 5 here, 5 is 100, that is 20. So that what we are left with is x times 101. 101x is equal to then 5.05 times 20. Let's find out 5.05 times 20. That will give us 1. 101 101 and then what do we do we divide both sides by 101 so 101 we cancel 101 so x 101 divided by 101 that will give us one mole per dm cube that will be our correct answer now if you look at the option that is definitely option a let's go to number 31 please which are the following elements will displace copper from a solution of copper Aeon. We know we have to revert to our knowledge on electrochemical series here. An element that is above copper in the electrochemical series will definitely displace copper. And let's look at the options here. Silver is below copper, hence it can't displace copper. Gold is equally below copper and hence it cannot displace copper. Mercury is below copper, it cannot displace copper, but lead, that's PB is above copper and that is the correct answer so lead being higher than copper in the chemical series can definitely displace copper from a solution of copper 2 aeon or copper 1 aeon so the correct answer is option c lead number 32 what is the percentage composition of carbon in calcium hydrogen triosocarbonate 4 Let's take a look at the board and see how we can solve this. Let's see how to calculate the percentage composition of carbon here. First things first, calcium hydrogen triosocarbonate 4. Let's find out what will be the molar mass here. Calcium is 40 plus hydrogen is 1 plus carbon, that's 12 plus Oxygen is 16. 16 times 3, that's 48. Then everything multiplied by 2. So this will give us 40 plus... Now, 1 plus 12 plus 48. That would definitely be 13 plus 48. That would be 61. That's 61 times 2. And this will translate to 40 plus... 61 times 2 gives us 122, 122, and that will give us 162. So we know now what the molar mass of calcium hydrogen carbonate 4 is. That's 162 gram per mole. Now to calculate the percentage of carbon, we now be we can see here that there are two carbon atoms because the two air affects everything in this bracket, carbon inclusive. So there are two carbon atoms, that's two carbon all over the entire molar mass here. We just calculated it to be 162, then times 100%. So carbon is 12, so this translates to 2 times 12 all over 162 times 100%. This will give us 2 times 12, will give us 24 all over 162 times 100 percent so let's see what would that give us 24 divided by 162 times 100 that will give us 14.81 percent so and if you take a look at the option that will be option b 14.8 percent that's to one decimal place or three significant 
figures. The correct option is B. Let's go to the next question, please. Number 33. Which of the following bond type is intermolecular? The only intermolecular bond here is hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bond exists between two or more molecules. So the correct answer here is hydrogen bond. And don't forget, students, that when hydrogen bond is present in certain compounds, they confer, it confers, by it I mean hydrogen bond, confers certain properties on certain compounds. When hydrogen bond is present in some compounds, such a compound can have unusually high boiling point. That is one of the reasons why ethanol, despite being an organic compound, organic compounds, ethanol is an organic compound. Not only that, ethanol is the covalent compound. And we know that organic compound and covalent compound tend to have low melting and boiling point. But ethanol have relatively high boiling point of 78 degrees Celsius. What accounts for that? That is the presence of the hydrogen bond in the hydroxy group. The same thing, the unusually high boiling point of water is due to the presence of hydrogen bond in the water. So the correct answer for B, it is only hydrogen bond that is an intermolecular bond out of the four options we are given here. Number 33 is B. Number 34, the maximum number of covalent bonds formed by nitrogen is dash. Nitrogen forms a maximum number of four covalent bonds. That is even evident in an ammonium molecule. Let's take a look at the board and see what, if you look at an ammonium ion, ammonium ion, you can see this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four. So you can see. So, one, two, three, four. So, nitrogen can form a maximum of four covalent bond. This is this. So, covalent bond between nitrogen and hydrogen, covalent bond between nitrogen and hydrogen, covalent bond between nitrogen and hydrogen. Although this is an example of a coordinate covalent between this particular nitrogen and the hydrogen ion. That is, when ammonia reacts with hydrogen ion, we all know that it does form a dative or coordinate covalent bond. The maximum number of covalent bond that can be formed by nitrogen is 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. So the correct answer is D. Let's go to the next question, number 35. The IUPAC name of the compound. This compound is, let's take a look at the board once more to write the molecular structure down. CH3 can be written like this. CH3 CH so CH and then CH3 so the CH3 is a substituent then CH that's C hydrogen then a double bond Immediately CH2 is the last one we know that it's going to be a double bond because if you start to be a single bond, then it will be ending with CH3. So this is CH2. Don't forget that a, a carbon atom can only form up to a maximum of four bonds. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So we want to find out what the name of this compound is. Don't forget this is the functional group of this particular compound, which is an alkane. And as such, we have to count from the side closest to the functional group, which is air. So they become one, the second carbon atom, the third, and then the fourth. So this now becomes one, two, three. That would be three methyl. Then one, two, three, four. That's going to be boot. And then the double bond is attached to the first carbon atom, boot one in. So if you look at the options on the board, the correct answer is option C, three methyl boot one in. Option C is the correct answer. Okay. Number 36, ionization energy increases across the period in the periodic table because is it because the atomic number increases? Is it because the effective nuclear charge increases? Or the mass number decreases? Or the screening effect 
decreases. The correct answer here is option B. The ionization energy increases across the period because the effective nuclear charge also increases. The effective nuclear charge talks about the gradual increase in the number of protons in the nucleus. And we know the, as the number of protons increases, that particular nucleus becomes more positively charged. And the force of attraction between the positively charged nucleus and the negatively charged valence electron now increases. And because of that, more energy will be needed to remove the valence electron from such an atom in gaseous state, which is what ionization energy is. We define ionization energy as the minimum amount of energy required or as the energy required to remove the most loosely bound electron from an atom in gaseous state. So what makes the ionization energy of elements to increase from left to right across the period is the gradual increase in the effective nuclear charge. The correct answer is option B. Don't forget that there are some factors that affect the ionization energy of an element. One of them is this, the effective nuclear charge Another one is the size of the atom. The smaller the size of the atom, the higher the ionization energy. Whereas the bigger the size of an atom, the lower the ionization energy. Another one is the screening or shielding effect. Now, the higher the shielding effect, the lower the ionization energy. Another one is electronic configuration. Those elements that have the noble gas electronic configuration, that is, they have completely filled outermost shell electron, such elements actually have extremely high ionization energy compared to elements like in group one that have one electron in their valence shell. Not only that, elements that have half filled valence shell, that is, if in, in the case of p orbital, the maximum number of electrons that can occupy p orbital is six. So if there are three electrons in p orbital, we say it is half filled. The maximum number of electrons that can occupy the d orbital is 10. If there are five electrons in d orbital, we say it is half filled. So half filled orbitals, half filled those elements that have half filled shells and completely filled shells usually have unusually high ionization energy. So these are some of the factors that affect ionization energy. Don't forget. The correct answer here is option B, number 37. Okay, number 37. Which of the following properties indicate that an element is a metal? Is it, Roman figure one, react with oxygen to form an acidic oxide? We know that is sent through. Acidic oxide are formed when a non-metal reacts with oxygen, not a metal. So, Roman figure one is incorrect. Roman figure 2 forms ionic chloride. That's correct. Because ion, for example, forms ionic chloride with chlorine. So Roman figure 2 is definitely an indication that an element is a metal. What about Roman figure 3? Has variable oxidation state. And Roman figure 4 displaces hydrogen from dilute HCl. We know that only metals can displace hydrogen and can displace copper can displace hydrogen rather from dilute AC, especially metals that are above hydrogen in the electrochemical state. So, Roman figure 2 is correct. So, also is Roman figure 4. So, the correct option should be 2 and 4. Which option is that? Option C. So, the correct answer for 37 is C. Let's go to number 38. The electronic configuration of carbon atom in its excited state is... Let's take a look at the board and see how to arrive at the correct answer here. We know that carbon has atomic number of six. And if you write the electrical configuration for carbon in, at grand state, not an excited state now, that would be one S2, two S2, and two P what? Two P2. And you can write it like this. This one S two, then this is two S two, and two P. We know that there are three subshells here. This is two P two. This is going to be two P X, 
this 2PY and this is 2PZ. Now, this is for carbon at the ground state. This is for ground state. But the question expects us to find the electric configuration of carbon at an excited state. Now, when we are writing the electric configuration of carbon at an excited state, one of the electrons in the 2s orbital here will gain energy and become excited. What does that mean? We move from a lower energy level to a higher energy level. We move from this 2s, so this comes here. Don't forget, when this leaves here, this one now becomes 2s1 because there are only one electron here, and this one now becomes 2p3. But don't forget, in 2px, there is now one, 2px1, 2py1, and 2pz1. So you can actually leave this alone. So the correct answer will now be 1. The correct answer will now be 1s2, that's for this, then 2s1, and then 2px1, then 2py1, and finally 2pz1. That is the correct answer. And if you take a look at the options here, which options satisfy that? Let's see. 1s2, 2s1, 2px1, 2py1, and 2pz1. Absolutely. That's option C. So the correct option for number 38 is C. Now, let's go to the next question. Number 39. An oxide has the following properties. Roman figure 1, it is a white powder. Roman figure 2, it reacts with hydrochloric acid. Roman figure 3, it reacts with sodium hydroxide. Roman figure 4, it's insoluble in water. The oxide is dash. We don't even need more than these two. We are told the oxide reacts with an acid like ACL, and the oxide we are told also reacts with a base like sodium hydroxide. The correct answer here is definitely amphoteric oxide. We know an amphoteric oxide is the only oxide that can react with both an acid and a base to form salt. So the correct answer is B, amphoteric oxide. Don't forget, there are several examples of amphoteric oxide. Lead oxide is amphoteric oxide. Zinc oxide is amphoteric oxide. Beryllium oxide is amphoteric oxide. Aluminum oxide is amphoteric oxide, and so on and so forth. So if you're talking about acidic oxide, there are several examples of acidic oxide. Carbon 4 oxide, CO2 is an acidic oxide. Sulfur 4 oxide, SO2 is an acidic oxide. Sulfur 6 oxide, SO3 is an acidic oxide. Nitrogen 4 oxide, NO2 is an acidic oxide, and so on and so forth. If you're talking about neutral oxide, water, H2O, is a neutral oxide. Nitrogen 2 oxide, NO is a neutral oxide. Carbon 2 oxide, CO is a neutral oxide. And dinitrogen 1 oxide, N2O is a neutral oxide. But an oxide that can react with an acid like hydrochloric acid and react with a base like sodium hydroxide is an amphoteric oxide. Option B. Let's go to number 40. Which of the following statements about atoms of a metal is correct? The if you look at all the options, the correct answer is D. They are held together by a sea of electron cloud. As a matter of fact, we know the type of bond that are present in metal, we refer to it as metallic bond. And what form metallic bond? Metallic bond are formed by the force of attraction between the nuclei of the metals and the sea of electrons surrounding them. So the correct answer here is option D. Hello students, I trust you are enjoying the class so far. Please don't forget to like, to share and to leave us a comment. And please, it will mean a lot to us if you could hit that sus subscription button and turn on the notification bell so that you'll be the first to be notified whenever a new content is uploaded. 